Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us on this beautiful Shabbat morning. Uh, today is Parasha Vayetze, which means, and he left. And we're going to be talking today about angels on the journey. So my name is Rabbi Harel Clint Fry, and I'm here in Perugia, Italy. Thank you for joining us today. I just want to open this time with prayer before we begin. <clears throat> so Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time to be in your presence. I, for one, really need to be in your presence, as we all do. And I always ask you to help me and help us to learn from your word and to learn of your ways. May what comes out of my mouth simply be from your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, and not from my flesh. And I ask you to guide us this day in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. So today we read from the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verse 10, through chapter 32, verse 2. Uh, my wife and I, Rebetzin Gabriela, we just spent the morning reading all of this. Plus, we read the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion in Hosea, chapter 12, verse 13, through chapter 14, verse 10. And then we read in for the Brit Harasha, which is the New Covenant, or the New Testament, Matthew, chapter 3, verse 13, through chapter 4, verse 11. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51, and chapter 4, verses 1 through 26, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. So I hope you enjoy your reading for today. <clears throat> We're going to open up this time now with the very first verse out of this parasha, which is Genesis 28, 10. Jacob, or Yaakov, left Beersheba and set out for Haran. So last week, if you remember in Parashat Todot, Rebecca and Isaac, or Rivka in Israel in Hebrew, had twin sons. Jacob, whom Rebecca favored, <clears throat> and Esau, whom Isaac favored. Now this week's Torah portion begins with Jacob leaving Beersheba, or Beersheba in English, and fleeing to Haran. If you remember, his brother wanted to kill him, obviously because he'd stolen his birthright, and his blessings <clears throat> from the father. So he's going to Haran, which is the land of his mother's family. Along the way, he stops for a night's sleep using a stone for a pillow. And if you ever go to Israel, if you've been there, if you sleep on some, uh, some people like to have really hard pillows. I remember renting uh, an apartment in Jerusalem from an Arab family. Uh, and the pillow that was used uh, by the man was extremely hard. It was a pillow, but it was hard, almost as hard as a rock. And I thought, why does somebody use such a hard pillow? It really hurt my neck and my head. Now I understand why. It must be something that was passed on from many generations. I don't know. Just a little sense of humor there, but it was true. <clears throat> so he used a stone for a pillow. In a dream, he sees a ladder reaching from earth to heaven with the angels of God, of Hashem, ascending and descending on it. The angels are first mentioned in this passage, so as ascending the ladder, which may indicate that they have been accompanying Jacob on his journey all along. So when we walk in the fear of Adonai, of the Lord, we can expect angels to protect us from evil. We may not see them, but by faith, we can be confident that even if we're without human friends on the journey, or maybe we might be in a difficult situation, we know that they are with us. We have unseen angelic beings with us to protect and help us along the way. Okay, but Jacob's dream doesn't end with the angels. Hashem himself appears to Jacob and identifies himself as Adonai, God of Abraham and Isaac, Jacob's father and grandfather, since it was these two that Hashem made the original promise. Now, by divine promise, the covenantal inheritance is passed on to Jacob. In Genesis 28, 13, it says, I am Adonai, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. <clears throat> Remember, with Abraham, he said, I'm going to give you the land on which you walk. Here he's saying the land which you're lying. I find that really interesting. It's pretty funny. Because it's still the same land. But 
instead of walking, he's lying. <laughs> so these are two, <clears throat> those of us who are descendants of Jacob can claim the land of Israel as our inheritance. Not by our own will, not by something we've said, okay, I claim this land, but by divine decree. Okay, so now we'll talk about Beit El or Bethel, which is the house of Hashem, of God. <clears throat> so it says in Genesis 28, 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God or Beit Elohim or Beit El. Okay, El is God, Beit is house. So this is the gate of heaven, Genesis 28, 17, like I said. So when Jacob wakes up from his dream, he marks the spot by putting up a stone on which the stone on which his head was resting. <clears throat> and he calls the place Bethel or Bethel, which, as I said, means the house of Hashem or God. So we usually think of the house of Hashem as a place of worship inside a building. But here we can see that Hashem is not contained inside or, or limited to physical structures. Any place can be made sacred by the presence of Hashem. This house we live in can be called Betel, <clears throat> your car. If you're traveling in the car and you're in his presence, it's a Betel. If you're in a camper, a tent, or out in the middle of nowhere, that can be Betel. doesn't matter where you are. We are <clears throat> in his presence. Okay, we got to remember that. If you understood what's about to come in these next years, Hashem is going to get rid of all these so-called churches or buildings that people meet in. He's going to bring his church, he's going to bring his body, the body of Yeshua, back to its simplicity, back to meeting in the homes, meeting in secret places, smaller groups, more intimacy, <clears throat> just as it was in the beginning of the book of Acts, for example. That's where he's going to bring it back to. All right? So, and there are many reasons he's going to do this. And he, he, I'm sure he will explain to you. If you ask him, he will show you the truth. Now, when Moses stood before the burning bush, for example, Hashem instructed him to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. The word for holy in Hebrew is kadosh, as many know. So, which means set apart for a special purpose. Okay, that's the word holy, what it means. Any place or space that is set apart by Hashem in his holy presence can become a big L in our lives. <clears throat> now I want to speak about the tithing or the tithe and what we would call the holy portion. All right, this is very interesting because I hear so many people say, well, tithing is just not biblical. It's just, we're in the New Testament. These are now, and that's then in the Old Testament. Strangely enough, people forget to remember that Hashem, Adonai, is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Okay? His word does not stop being his word just because times have changed. And this is something that happens here in Italy a lot, which I don't understand. I'm very thankful that in the United States and Canada and other countries, the body of Yeshua still believe in tithing <clears throat> and giving their offerings. And it's not to make people rich so it can rich live, live richly. No, it's so that the body can grow, the body can expand and do what it needs to do. And yes, it takes money to do it. Things aren't free. So here it says Genesis in 28 verses 20 through 22, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God or Hashem will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. <clears throat> Here's the first tithing. Okay, it's not just a, a sacrifice or an offering, which has been done before. He's talking about, I'm going to give you 10% of everything that I get. Jacob made a vow to devote the tenth to Hashem's service. This is, this is something that came from his heart. This is where it comes from. And, you know, remember later on, it says, he says, I love a cheerful giver. This is Hashem speaking, right? I don't I don't want somebody who gives because they have to. I want somebody who gives because they desire to, want to. So I always ask myself, those who say they don't need to tithe or don't want to tithe, I have to ask, where is their heart? Where does it belong to? Obviously, it belongs to money. It belongs to goods and, and things. 
it doesn't belong to God. And I always ask myself, do they even belong to him? And I really doubt it. But that's between him and them. So this is the first time a vow is mentioned in the Bible. And it's interesting that this vow to give the tithe in, is in response to Hashem's provision. <clears throat> All right. So it's every good and perfect gift what we know comes from above. Your job, your house, everything you have comes from above. It doesn't come just because you work hard. Yeah, you work hard and you're a good worker. Therefore, you have a job and your boss doesn't fire you. But that job came from Hashem. Okay. Everything we have comes from him. He is our true source of provision. And if you do lose your job, just pray and say, Lord, you know my needs. I need another job. And he'll give it to you. Maybe a better one. Or just something he knows he wants for you to learn something. You never know. <clears throat> okay. So he's our true source of provision. Not man. Not our skills or our intelligence, which he's given to us. Okay. He gave us our skills and intelligence. They didn't come from us. Not our job, like I said, or our investments. Those come from him. He can use them. He can use them to bless you. But they are not from you. It's Hashem's, it is Hashem who provides all of our needs according to his riches in Messiah, Yeshua. And you can see this in Philippians 4.19 if you want to go check that out. So the only thing he asked for with the promise of a multiplied return, so this is a promise on his part, is the first 10% of the prosperity he blesses us with. I always make sure I give a tenth of what we get every month and even more because I want to make sure that I'm sowing into his kingdom. And I give that tenth into the ministry. I do not keep it. And once a year, we give a tenth of the tenth to Israel, <clears throat> to a ministry in Israel. And each time we pray, where do you want us to give it? Sometimes he says to give it to this place. Sometimes he says to give it to another place. But we always ask. Okay. Giving the tithe protects us also from the tendency of our flesh towards being greedy. All right. It also says that we acknowledge Hashem as our true source and give back what is kadosh or set aside or holy. All right. That 10% is holy. It's not yours. It's set aside. The set apart portion of our finances, which he has given us in the first place. <clears throat> and if you don't think so, if you want to test him on this, he could have your job taken away to teach you. Hey, by the way, you don't want to do what I asked you to do. Let's see how you do now. Oh, no, he can do that. You know, he's done it to me in my, in my life. He's, he's, he's done things or a lot of things that happen to teach me a lesson. Once I learned the lesson, I continue on my way and he blessed me with what I needed. But he does it. He does it because he loves us. It says in the Bible that the Lord, I deny, disciplines those he loves. Okay, he does it out of love. So why is it a tenth of our income? Why is it a 10%? Why not 2%, 15 or 20 or whatever? Numbers are important in Judaism. And if you know, <clears throat> if you look at the Bible, it's full of numbers, right? And we can look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah for an example. When Adam interceded for the salvation of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, it came down to a number of 10. Remember, he said, even if you find 10 people, will you save it? And Hashem said that for the sake of 10, he would hold back the destroyer. Obviously, he did not find 10 people in Sodom, so he destroyed it. In fact, he, the ones that were righteous, he brought them out. <clears throat> so it works the same way with our finances. For the sake of a tenth of our finances, Hashem promises to hold back the destroyer from our material goods. So if you're losing things, if you're losing your money, if you're losing your house, you're losing your job, or something's going wrong, ask the Lord, say, what's going on? Check your heart. Are you giving that 10%? Are you doing it? Are you being faithful to his word? It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Here's the only time when the Lord says to test him in the whole Bible. Okay. Remember that. <laughs> says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. This is found in Malachi 3.10. So don't go saying, well, that's in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. Like I said, he doesn't change. If it's written, what he wrote back then is still valid 
now. Okay, so just because we're in the age of grace doesn't make his word any less important or any less valid. Those who do make the commitment to tithe and who follow through on their vow faithfully, you might forget for a moment, say, oh, this month I forgot. Just do it. Make sure it happens at some point, okay? God knows, Hashem knows when we've been distracted uh, momentarily, okay? <clears throat> it can happen. It happened to me one month. I just made sure that the next month I made the double tithe for the month prior, okay? So those who do this will find that Hashem is also faithful to rebuke the devourer for our sakes and to bless and prosper us in return. It says in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, Honor Adonai with your possessions, with the first fruit of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now I'd like to talk about another subject, about love at first sight. This is the beautiful part of this parasha. I really like it. It says in Genesis 29, 18, Jacob was in love with, Rebe with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in, refer in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. So in Genesis chapter 29, Jacob meets Rachel, his love at first sight. He, as soon as Jacob sees her, he kisses her and lifts up his voice and weeps. Obviously, he gave her a kiss on the cheek, you know. Let's take this into a cultural context. So he's telling her he is a relative of her father. Jacob agrees to work for his uncle, Laban, or in Hebrew, it's Laban for seven years in return for Rachel's hand in marriage. And he works for seven years before he gets to be married to her, okay? But it seems like only a few days because of his great love for her. However, the plot becomes quite interesting when Laban tricks Jacob in marrying to his firstborn daughter, Leah, <coughs> instead of Rachel, right? Because at that, at that time they put, they, they covered him and they had a veil, not just this little flimsy white thing, but a, a veil <coughs> that you could not see into. And this, <clears throat> so he tricked her, him into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. And this is a reason why until today, and we have our Jewish custom that continues, it's called Betekin Kala. It means the checking of the bride. And what is it? Before each Jewish ceremony, <laughs> the wedding ceremony, men bring in their bridegroom to lift the veil of his intended bride to make sure he's not being tricked. He can check she's the right woman. And then no one has pulled a Laban on him. It's pretty funny. But who knows? Maybe something could happen even nowadays. <laughs> you find somebody else. I don't know. But it's pretty, it's pretty interesting how that works. So <clears throat> now we're going to talk about sowing and reaping. Because here's where it talks about, what is this that you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Genesis 29, 25. I love this. Coming from... A man, Jacob, who <clears throat> did nothing but deceive people. He deceived his brother into giving over his uh, his firstborn, being being the right of the firstborn, and then he deceived his father in giving him his blessing, his brother's blessing. So he deceived two times. I love it. He's the, the talk about the pot calling the tea kettle black, right? So. <clears throat> While we can cast Jacob in the role of poor deceived victim, we can also recognize that a spiritual law is in action here. All right. Jacob, whose very name can mean by the heel, but also means a deceiver, <clears throat> tricked Isaac, like I said, his father into thinking he was Esau, so he could receive the blessing of the firstborn. And in a similar way, Laban deceives Jacob by substituting Leah for Rachel during the marriage ceremony. It seems that Jacob was reaping what he sowed. <laughs> We deceived, or he deceived and was deceived. Our actions are like seeds that we sow. So as surely as apple grows from trees, from apple seeds, we reap whatever we sow, whether for good or evil. There's an old saying, right? We'll talk about that later. But whatever we do to others, we're going to reap a harvest of that action. Whether it might be immediately, it could be a day from now, a year, years, months, eons, Decades, we don't know, but sometime it will come back on us. And <clears throat> I can tell you for sure in my life, I've seen that happen. And it's not good. So try to sow righteous seeds. Comes back. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. Yeshua or Jesus confirmed this law when he said, 
that as we give, so it should be given unto us. Luke 6.38 says, given it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So like I said, there's a common saying that says what comes around, or what goes around comes around. <clears throat> right? So it's a circle. What you give, you're going to receive. We give out lies, trickery, and deception. It's going to come back to us one way or another. Okay? Whether it's in your job or in your relationships, whatever, it doesn't matter. It will come back to bite you. However, if we give out love, kindness, and mercy, grace, et cetera, et cetera, we will also receive these treasures in return. Okay. So, and this is written in many times in the Bible. If you don't believe me, just go check it out. Google it. Check it out in your Bible. There are many places where it talks about this. Now I'd like to talk about Israel and the law of sowing and reaping. So it says the day of Adonai is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 15. <clears throat> so the Bible reveals that the law of sowing and reaping applies to the way the nations treat the land of Israel. Treats the Israelites, the Jews. In the first chapter of Obadiah, Hashem says that what the nations do to Israel will be returned upon their heads. Yep. In Israel, for example, children go to school, and you never know if they're going to become a nerve missile attack. It's often, or sometimes not often, reported in the world's news. Missiles are a constant reality in the south, not far from Beersheba, where Jacob had his dream. Not just the south, but even other parts now, in the north. <clears throat> Scripture makes it very plain, however, that those who stand against the Jewish people's right to the land of Israel are positioning themselves against Hashem, the Almighty God. And this is written in the word of Hashem. So for those who live in the Holy Land, scriptures about Hashem's protection are comforting. It says the angel of Adonai is encamped all around those who fear him and delivers him. Psalm 34, 7. Obviously, many people in Israel don't fear Adonai. They don't even care about him or don't think he exists. He'll deal with those people later. We are confident, however, that Hashem is for us in our struggle to remain in the land that he gave to us. All right? <clears throat> so in Romans 8.31, it says, What then shall we say in response to this? If Hashem is for us, if God is for us, who could be against us? Now I'd like to talk about generational curses. It says in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, it says, He did not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now, I'm very thankful that <clears throat> this is not true anymore, that he says, hey, if you sin, you're going to pay for your own sins. I'm not going to take it out on your children. Okay? However, we can pass down excuse me, generational curses. There's another issue that comes into play in the story of Jacob's life, the reality of generational curses. Well, throughout the generation of the generations of the patriarchs, there seems to be a problem with deception. We don't know how far back the sin of deception goes. Well, we do. I mean, come on. Since the Garden of Eden, right? But we do know that Abraham asked Sarah to present herself, for example, as his sister, rather than as his wife, in order to save his own skin. Okay? He didn't want to get killed because she was beautiful. In the next generation, we see the same kind of deception. Abraham's son Isaac presents his wife, Rebecca, as his sister also. Isaac's son Jacob used deceit to manipulate for his own purposes, as we were just talking about. So in obedience to his mother, Jacob represent, uh, presents himself as his twin brother Esau to his visually impaired father in order to receive the blessing of the firstborn son found in Genesis 27. <clears throat> and we just talked about it last week. So just as Isaac and Jacob inherited the blessing from their father Abraham, they also seem to inherit some of his sinful tendencies of deception. So still, although the word of Hashem says that the sins of the fathers will be passed down to the third or fourth generation, it also says that his mercy extends 
to the thousandth generation of, to those who love him and keep his commandments. This is found in Exodus 34, 7. So where is our hope? It says, know therefore that Adonai your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Deuteronomy 7, 9. <clears throat> so what hope is there for us if our family tree, for example, is less than perfect? And we all know they all are. There's going to be some sin in our past generations. Huh? Maybe great-grandfather or grandfather. Somebody had an addiction to <clears throat> sexual sin or uh, alcoholic or violence and, and, and whatnot. You can be many things, right? Gambling, cheating. All this goes on, right? What if our ancestors have not loved Hashem with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? <clears throat> what if they had glaring sin in their lives? And we now see the same tendencies in our own selves or our children. What hope do we have if we know that we have? Or what hope do we have if we know that we have will, willfully or in ignorance planted some bad seed that will surely produce a harvest of unrighteousness and undesirable consequences in our lives. Our hope is in Yeshua, Jesus, and the work that he completed by his death and resurrection. That's it. Okay. When Yeshua was, sacked, was crucified, he wore a crown of thorns upon his own head. Those thorns were the product of the curse resulting from man's sinful rebellion against Hashem. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. All right, so thanks to the, thanks be to Hashem, that he who knew no sin became a curse for us, to Yeshua, so that the curses could be broken in our lives. And in generations to come. And we can see this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We can be thankful that when he wore that crown of thorns. Or in Hebrew it's kotzim. Upon his brow. And hung on that tree or that cross. He broke the power of these generational curses. It says in Galatians 3.13. Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us. For it is written. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So, now I'd like to talk about Yehuda. Yehuda means praise Adonai. So, in the matriarchs of our faith, we can also see generational curses at work, like I said, as well as Hashem's supernatural intervention on their behalf. No matter the fact that they were sinning and being deceitful, whatever, Hashem chose to bless them and use them and be with them. Both Rachel and Sarah were barren, and they needed Hashem's supernatural intervention to conceive. Just like Sarah, Rachel, or Rachel, complicated the situation by giving her handmaid to her husband for the purpose of producing a child. Since in the Middle Eastern culture at that time, barrenness brought terrible grief and shame to a woman. Rachel demanded that Jacob give her children, even though the problem was obviously not with him, as Leah was extremely fertile and had children left and right. So it's kind of like what we do. We tend, to, we tend to do the same thing. We have to blame someone else for our own problems. And then we try to do things in our own flesh, which create more problems. <laughs> Hashem saw that Leah was not loved by her husband, so he seemed to compensate her with many children. Pathetically, she thought with each child born that her husband would love her each time. It wasn't the case. Strangely enough, he seemed to give her a lot of children for somebody who didn't love the person, but <laughs> I never understood that. This is found in Genesis 29, 32, for example. And she thought that each time she would have a child from him, that he would love her. But finally, with the birth of her last son, she got beyond her pain and named him Yehuda or Judah, meaning God is to be praised or thanked. And she said, this time I will praise Adonai. Genesis 29, 35. She got to the point where she learned something we all need to learn in terms 
that in the end, what's most important is our relationship with Adonai, no matter what our relationship is uh, with is those could be with those who are around us. We should direct our attention to him and come to him with grateful hearts and praise and thanksgiving, no matter what we're living. So in closing, I just want to come back <clears throat> to Rachel and Leah. So I'm going to ask for people to give comments about this. Okay. I really want to hear what you, you, you think about this, this uh, subject. When Jacob took Esau's birthright and blessing, like I said, he, he got more than he bargained for. He got two wives. Okay. And this is going to be kind of funny. This is uh, something that is coming from a different tradition. Okay. Here's how it happened. Laban had two daughters, <coughs> Rachel and Leah. Leah was the older one, but the Torah says that she had weak eyes. I'm guessing the lazy eyes, right? <clears throat> Rachel, on the other hand, was beautiful. What does it mean that Leah had weak eyes? These are just thoughts. These are not my thoughts, okay? The Hebrew word translated here as weak can also mean delicate, tender, or soft. So some translations understand that in the sense of beautiful eyes. Doesn't make any sense, but obviously this is a different translation. In that case, the Torah would be saying Leah had beautiful eyes. <clears throat> but Rachel had a beautiful figure and face. Leah had beautiful eyes, but were not as, was not as attractive as her sister. So there is a man named Rashi who explains that Leah's eyes were weak because she thought she was destined to marry Esau. And therefore, she was constantly crying. Think about it. Esau was the firstborn, right? Leah was the firstborn. <clears throat> so if Jacob was the secondborn, he would have been supposed to marry Rachel. And Esau should have married Leah. She believed that she was destined to marry Esau. Remember, this is just something that Rashi came up with. She would cry because everybody said, Rebecca has two sons and Laban has two daughters. The older will marry the older and the younger the younger. And this is what this Rashi said about Genesis 29, 17. So obviously, this is probably not the real reason for Leah's weak eyes. This is something that that somebody came up with. But it does raise an interesting point. We know that Esau married the Canaanite girls against his parents' wishes and desires. <clears throat> they know that his mother and father preferred him to marry within the greater Abrahamic family, not the evil people of Canaan, the idolaters. They would have been a logical choice for him. And it seems natural that the firstborn would have married the firstborn and the secondborn the secondborn. However, Jacob fell in love with the second born Rachel because he was second born. But legally, he had already taken Esau's position as the first born over the family, both his uh, deception when he purchased Esau's birthright. Wow. And this is something I never thought about. This is kind of cool. So Leah was the one God had chosen to be the wife of the progenitor of Abrahamic blessing. When Jacob took that position from Esau, he unwittingly acquired Leah as well. He took Esau's wife. <clears throat> so Jacob worked seven years to pay the bride price for Rachel. On their wedding night, as you know, like we said, Laban switched his daughters. He was sneaky. He disguised Leah as Rachel, just as Jacob had disguised himself as Esau to trick Isaac. The trick worked. Jacob accidentally married Leah. Laban switched his daughters on the wedding night, sim wedding night simply to get another seven years of work out of Jacob. So by doing this swap or this exchange <clears throat> would not have been difficult. As we know, in the custom of the ancient times, the bride would have been completely veiled and in an extravagant dress, therefore unrecognizable. Her unveiling happened only in the bridal chamber or in a tent in the dark. That's it. So many, like I said, many Jewish communities today still have that tradition of completely veiling the bride on a wedding day. Uh, but the bridegroom is allowed to lift the veil just before the ceremony to make sure he's marrying the right girl. <clears throat> so Jacob's accidental marriage to Leah is a good example of how Hashem works in our lives. We make plans. We dream dreams, set out to accomplish certain things. <laughs> then our plans are frustrated somehow and our dreams come to nothing. 
and we find ourselves far away from our original goals. This does not mean that Hashem has abandoned us. In fact, it says in the Bible, all things work together for the good of those who love Hashem and are called according to his purpose, right? So your plans for your, my, your life may not be necessarily his, his plans, okay? Hashem may be attempting to work something great through your situation that you never expected. I know in my life, <clears throat> I have an incredible wife after all I've been through in my life, and he has given me so much blessings after many things and trials and tribulations that I've been through, and I thought he had abandoned me. But I come to find out he was just preparing the way. It's so incredible. So through Leah, Jacob gave birth or sired Judah and Levi, who in turn fathered the line of the Davidic monarchy and the Aaronic priesthood. He never intended to marry her, but the spiritual greatness of Israel came through Leah. Right? <clears throat> because that's where our Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua, came from. From the tribe of Judah, tribe of Judah. So this is really incredible. And I would like to just invite now anybody who has not ever accepted Yeshua as Moshiach, as your Savior, to do so now, because now is the time. And if you think if you don't know, understand how this could be, just read the work of Isaiah 53, chapter 53, and it talks about Yeshua. If you want, <clears throat> Give me your information. Write to us. There's a contact link below. Give us your name, your address, email, whatever. I'll get you a book to read. It's called Isaiah 53 Explained. It's such an awesome book. It explains about how Isaiah 53 points to Yeshua as Moshiach. And it's free. <clears throat> it doesn't cost you a penny. If you already want to decide, you've already decided in your heart, you believe in Yeshua as your Moshiach. It says in the Bible, anybody who believes in him will be saved. In another section, it says, I am the way, the truth, and life. This is Yeshua speaking. There is no way to the Father except through me. But you have to go through Yeshua to be saved. You can do all the mitzvot in your life you want, all the great things, you know, all the nice things, uh, acts <clears throat> is not going to save you. We are not saved by acts, but by his grace and his mercy. That's it. So if you're ready to do this, I invite you to say this prayer with me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Eterech HaYeshua B'Meshiach Yeshua In English, it's simply, Blessed are you, Lord or God, King of the Universe, who has given us the way of salvation and Messiah, Yeshua. I really hope that somebody will accept Yeshua today. If you have, just give us, shoot us an, uh, an email, and there's a contact link below. We'd love to hear from you. We'll still give you something for free. Even if you want the book or something else, we'll give you a free gift. And welcome you to the family of the Messiah, Yeshua, and of our Heavenly Father, so if you have any <clears throat> comments, we, we welcome comments. I'd like to hear about comments about this uh, thing we were talking about, about Leah and Rebecca. I think it's pretty interesting. And if you also need help, you need counseling for anything. But Rebetzin Gabriela, my wife, is a licensed counselor. There is a link below called Machase Shel Tikpa, which will take you to the website. <clears throat> and you can contact you through there, see what we offer. It's, it's all counseling based on biblical principles. And it's really wonderful. If you have a heart to help us uh, in any way with our ministry, we, we could really use your help and we could use some offerings if you'd like. Now, may you be blessed. We do everything for free out of love for you and out of obedience to Hashem. And um, so there's a link at the bottom for that also. So as we close this time together, I just want to bless you with your honor blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai 
Perish mereka ya em Adonai ana belecha bihuneka is Adonai ana belecha besehem lecha Beseim lecha shalom. Beshem Yeshua Hamashiach. Sarah shalom shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shalom. Thank you for joining us today. Shabbat shalom to all of you.